This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I am the voice of MDH Podcast, Nick Andrews. This week on Clinical Correlation, what patients remember. And welcome to episode 59 of Blood and Cancer. I'm joined this week, as I always am, by the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology and the voice of this particular program, Dr. David Henry. And Dr. Henry and I, before we got on, were talking about the bad beats in sports because, Dr. Henry, as we record this, you just got back from uh, a local area college basketball game. Villanova basketball is something I've always wanted to experience in person. So it, it really is a lot of fun, college basketball. I live in Villanova, and my daughter went to Villanova, so... I had the great pleasure of going to the game tonight with her, and we had uh, pretty good seats. We spurs a bit and got some good seats, yeah. and we watched a really good game, and there's so much electricity at these college games. There's constant entertainment during the timeouts, uh, all these cheerleaders flying through the air, and people trying to sink baskets to win a car, and it's uh, a lot of fun. And uh, Villanova uh, beat St. John, and... Um, off we go, getting never ready for March Madness. Yeah, that's a big. Uh, it's yeah, it's a big throwdown for for that conference, and that's what a cool way to spend a weekday evening. But we've got a lot going on on this episode of the show as well. First, let's talk about clinical correlation with Dr. Yerkowitz. Last week was it was a bit heavy talking about uh, adherence and what when patients do and don't adhere, and how you don't want to be biased when you think a patient will or won't. This week, something a little different. It's about what patients remember about their prognosis or about their visits or about anything to do with their situation. And this is really interesting. I can't wait to hear what she says because I'm sometimes with a medical student and we'll talk to a patient, especially at time of diagnosis or change in therapy. And I watch the patient's eyes because as soon as the eyes leave me, they're thinking and they're not listening. And a medical student once said to me, you told her the same thing three times. She kept asking. I said, well, she moved off into space thinking about what was happening and implications and cancer and diagnosis and survival. And then she comes back with her eyes and I say it again. And um, I, Ilana covers that either in the visit or you say it in visit one and at visit two, they go, now what was happening with my therapy? So don't remember because it's such high emotional stakes is a common issue. Yeah, it, it's such an unbelievable amount of information, both like cognitively to, to, to take in, but also, like you said, an emotional toll. It's almost as if it would be good to like record it. If you, if you, yeah, as a patient, yeah. you want to go back in, but such a difficult task. And, and she conquers that in the clinical correlation segment, which can be found after our interview. Interview this week is with Dr. James Foran, and we are talking about leukemia, in particular AML. And this is one of the better interviews I think that we've done in quite a while. Not to say anything against our recent interviews, but this one just had so much information, and there was such depth at the different levels of the information. Yeah, I um I became a fan of Dr. Foran when I went to an ASH update in New York in January, and he actually was the master of ceremonies and also gave the talk on AML. And thinking back to my fellowship days yesteryear, and often um, now we all talk about three and seven, so an, an anthracycline like Donna Rubison and seven being the ARC, and um, have we gotten better? And of course, he said yes, and he had this wonderful algorithm, which we go through in our interview, that um, pretty quickly, you can get next-gen sequencing within seven days and determine whether or not you're going to use some special therapies if you're so a cytogenetic or fish for FLT3 or, I, or IDH mutations, and that will lead you to different drugs and different prognosis and different outcomes, many of which are very positive. So he, he had a very nice um, thoughtful algorithm to go through that and explains and decodes a very high drama topic uh, and settles us all down to go at it and hope for the best. And if you like what you hear and you want to get more information out of it, there are robust show notes available as there always are in, wherever show notes are available in your particular podcast app. It'll be under the info sign or the more sign, wherever you listen, Apple podcast, Spotify, pocket cast, et cetera. They're authored this week by Dr. Depok. Let me try this again. Dr. Debika. Debe Debika. She's one of our Debeka. newer intern resident, Debika Shinahara. Shinahara. And she already has some nice background in oncology and hit the ground running at Pennsylvania Hospital. And we grabbed her to join in our sometime weekly show notes. We have a couple of the residents who are also similarly inclined. And, and she did a wonderful job with the show notes this week. Yeah, she did. She really did. And give her credit. She's an MD, PhD. And uh, we're, we're yeah. glad to have her working with us. This is one of her first times, I believe, uh, contributing the show notes. And they're excellent. So if you want more, you can check them out. They have references and links 
uh, to both the guest as well as different references cited in the interview. So with that, let's get to the interview with uh, Dr. David Henry and Dr. James Foran. Thanks so much. Hope you all listen next week. Welcome to this podcast. I'm Dr. David Henry, your host for Blood and Cancer, our podcast which discusses benign and malignant hematology and oncology each week and airs or mails, so to speak, where you get your podcast every Thursday morning each week. And this is an electronic journal where you can find us on mdedge.com slash hematology dash oncology or mdedge.com slash podcasts where you could download the podcast for your enjoyment when you're on the road or on the exercise bike, etc. And so I'm delighted today to be talking to Dr. James Foran at the Mayo Clinic, where he's an associate professor and chair of the leukemia group at the Mayo Clinic. So James, welcome, and thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, Dr. Henry, thank you so much. I'm delighted to uh, to talk to you. Well, you're you're very welcome. And um, for our audience, I uh, not only go to ASH, but find the ASH update, which ASH puts on afterwards, so-called highlights of ASH, uh, several sites around the country, so I recommend it to everyone. That James led in the New York session I went to last month in January, and he talked about AML. And I, uh, days going by, everyone would have their camera. And now everyone just ups their iPhone when certain key slides come up. And James did this wonderful talk with an intro slide about uh, approach to acute leukemia. And of course, I trained a few years ago when it was seven and three, and I was happy to see that's not always the case of seven days of RSC and three days of a of an anthocycline. So what I thought we would do is I have handy um, my picture of your slide, and I thought I would lead us off and have you take us through your approach by saying, for example, um, I go into the hospital and my house staff say, gee, you better see this patient. I think it's acute leukemia, and we'll pose a man, no much, in, nothing much in the way of comorbid disease, 50, white counts 30,000. Yeah. We look at the smear, it's 90% blast. We find a couple hour rods. He has a hemolytic of 10 platelets of 20, and we call you. And um, I'm looking at your slide now on the first side. It says patient eligible for intensive chemotherapy. Maybe you can step us through those few boxes that you looked, that you showed us and what you want to test for and then do. Yeah, thanks very much. Well, you know, it's uh, when I trained, uh, I'm old enough to say in the 1990s, we would have said this patient needs to start treatment within 24 or 48 hours, and it's a medical emergency. And the truth is it's still an urgent situation, especially if that person has a high white cell count. But we've learned uh, from experience, and this is recognized in the NCCN guidelines, and then with some data at ASH from a, a couple of different studies, that when you can, if that patient is appropriate to wait long enough, and most are, that it's better to wait to try to get some results back. And the key questions you'd want to ask are, is this therapy-related AML or AML with MDS-related changes? Uh, and do they have a FLT3 ITD mutation or a FLT3 activating mutation? Um, and then also to, to do a workup for comorbidities and for, for cytogenetics. We think that people should have, should have um, you know, a diagnosis in 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. We think that FISH studies can come back in two to three days, and cytogenetics should be within a week with a little bit of pressure in your lab. And we think a FLT3 test should come back in, in three working days, at least for a line item FLT3 ITD. Uh, we would generally recommend launching next generation sequencing to look for mutations, but particularly for a FLT3, because we've learned that there are survival advantages of adding the FLT3 inhibitor mitostorin in the first line setting if somebody has a FLT3 mutation. We uh, looks like there is uh, a survival advantage for using the liposomal formulation of donorubicin cytarabine. It's called CPX351 or Vixios. If they have secondary AML or therapy-related or have MDS-related changes in their cytogenetics. And then the other issue is, is whether they have a core binding factor of favorable leukemia where there's pretty compelling uh, data from meta-analyses uh, that show a survival advantage of adding gemtuzumab. So 7 and 3 still in the mix for all of those scenarios, except for the liposomal um, donorubicin and cytarabine, which is its own formulation. But you want to be rational about picking, is this a person who would be appropriate for us to add gemtuzumab, or it used to be called Mylotarg, or actually still right. is, yeah. CD33, yeah, you know it. I and, um, and And then, yeah, and you want to know if the FLT3 status. So 
this is still a patient we would treat with curative intent. You definitely want to induce a remission. Donorubus and cytarabine remain really central in this, but it's a question of what are the best additives to that to try to get you anywhere from a 7 to a 20% improvement in overall survival, depending on, on those areas. So to decode that a bit for me, uh, the CPX351, the liposomal combination formulation, that's not all, because it seems so attractive, but that's not always used, um, depending on these other yeah. features you've just mentioned. Yeah, you know, the pivotal study really restricted it to patients, um, I think in the study it was age 50 to 70, if I recall correctly, I think that's right, um, and who had therapy-related AML or secondary or had MDS-related cytogenetics. And that's the group where we really believe that there's a higher complete remission rate, a survival advantage. Honestly, some of that survival advantage came after subsequent allogeneic transplant, so you want to use it in a patient where you think that might be part of the mix also. There were previous studies that showed about equivalence in the in, in, in general, so it's not worse to give it as far as we can tell. There are now studies in the pediatric setting to see is it less toxic to give a liposomal uh, anthracycline in terms of cardiotoxicity. So you can't say it's wrong to give it, but it's an expensive drug, and we you want to kind of use it on label whenever possible, and I'm going to just get behind the FDA on that one. Mm-hmm. And and I think it it's competing a little bit with gemtuzumab as an additive or mitostorin if you have a FLT3 mutation. And these are expensive drugs. And until we know that it's safe and appropriate to combine them, I think you want to know what direction you're going and take the, the three or five days as long as that patient can do it, and as long as it's safe for them and they're not too proliferative, to get those details right because it turns out it matters what you start with. So if I could decode that, I, I think I've got it straight now. That makes a lot of sense. So if we have maybe an MDS going to AML or a therapy-induced AML, we're going to stay with the, the liposomal combination, the CPX351. However, if, we have, if we're fortunate enough to have a de novo AML, we're going to pause, maybe control whatever count we need to control to keep the patient steady for a few days, get that CBF um, uh, finding, the FLT3 detection, and um, absent that, we might um, still do the standard 3 and 7 or, um, so back to, to, again, to say it again, the CBF would be a gemtuzumab, the FLT3 would be the mitostorin, and then um, maybe with the MDS or the treatment derived, the, the combination liposomal. Now, in that mix, I saw you mention the IDH1-2 mutation. Can you throw that in, and where does that take us? Yeah, we're getting those back more and more on the limited uh, PCR-based panels. That obviously, they're in the NGS panel. So those results are coming in. And we have approved inhibitors for IDH1 and IDH2. Um, actually, the FDA approved the IDH1 inhibitor, ivacidinib, as a single agent for frail elderly AML in the first-line setting. It has some activity there. And so the question is, how do you incorporate that? Now, at ASH 2018, there was a very nice, large Phase two study where The IDH1 or the IDH2, respectively, were added to 7 and 3 if you had an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation in induction, in consolidation, and for uh, a year of maintenance. I think it was a year of maintenance in that study. It showed very good complete remission rates. It showed a very good one-year survival. They tended to be older patients in that study, and it was quite favorable, but it wasn't comparative. So we know you can do it. We just don't know that it's better yet. And those drugs are expensive. Um, and so I think that's still an open question about do you target that by adding the IDH1 or 2 inhibitor, or do you just treat generically for AML induction in that setting? Um, and, and we don't know the answer to that. Okay. It's, a, it's a little more complicated. In this patient you presented, he's younger, he's fit, he's eligible for cure. You want to treat for cure. And, and we don't, I don't think we've really embraced adding IDH1 or 2 therapy to 7 and 3 yet. But in older patients with low-intensity treatments, it's a little more controversial, and that, that's a little more complicated. Well, we're we're going to take you to the complicated in just one second. So to finish out this uh, straightforward 50-year-old non-comorbid disease, I think I heard you say from the podium that there may be a maintenance therapy, um, possibly with a uh, hypomethylating agent. So could you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, that was a late-breaking abstract at Ash, and very compelling, and a little surprising actually. I we were offered the chance to participate in that study and didn't because I was a bit dubious and I was wrong. Um, this is oral de- or oral azacitidine or uh, oral formulation of azacitidine, given two weeks on and two weeks off indefinitely in patients who got remission induction therapy uh, with with a seven and three base regimen. Most of them on that study got consolidation, about 85%, not everybody, and they were randomized to get a placebo or oral azacitidine. Now, this is drug was called CC486. It's a, a cell gene drug. I think cell gene is a new company now. I think that's BMS now, but mm-hmm. um, it showed a survival advantage, and it was a significant survival advantage. Uh, there was some GI toxicity. There was a little bit of hematologic toxicity from this, and they had to lower the dose to get it in, but it it was associated with a significant improvement in remission duration and a significant improvement in overall survival. And that's going to change the landscape for us. The drug's not yet available. Uh, there are some older studies showing that maybe maintenance azacitidine for a year, low dose. The Dutch showed that maybe there's an advantage in elderly AML. That's not easy to translate with this new data, so we're not embracing that necessarily as a standard. But when this drug gets available, I think it's going to change and should change for patients who do not go to transplant as a maintenance arm. And and you probably know from some of the other ASH abstracts, particularly in MDS, that there's hopefully soon going to be even an oral D-cytobine equivalent. So we'll have more options in the future. But with this CC486, that it, it had a significant impact, and that was one of the highlighted late-breaking abstracts, and I think will change our landscape once that gets regulatory approval. Boy, very interesting. So we'll leave our... Rather straightforward 50-year-old, before we go now to the 84-year-old I have in the hospital, by saying that in this patient with the very straightforward presentation, we're going to pause a few days, get him ready, be sure we address other issues like cell counts, and we're going to wait for our studies to come back, CBF, FLT3, we'd love to know IDH1 and 2 for interest, and that may guide our therapy and, uh, of course, try and decide whether he's MDS or treatment-induced or de novo AML. So then we go to an 84-year-old, which um, this is now my second one, who um, appears to have gotten to this AML status through MDS. And can you guide us through, and she has, of course, um, some hypertension, atrial fibrillation, has been on and off, some anticoagulation, has um, a low CBC, uh, so not a high white count, not a, uh, so a little right. anemia, lowish plate of the count, and 4,000 white cells with some blasts, and a bone marrow shows Oh, 60% blast. And now, can you yeah. step us through this algorithm in this older, not-so-fit patient? Yeah, and that's a more common scenario. I mean, as you know, AML, the median age is about 70 or 72 in the Western Hemisphere. So that this your patient is similar to patients that a lot of us see, and it's a, a much more, uh, it's a little more complicated um, Landscape. I'll start by saying that as a general rule, as long as somebody has a performance status of two or better, an ECOG performance status of two or better, mm-hmm. or a KPS mm-hmm. of 50 or 60 percent or better, that we think it's worth treating. There was a randomized study of low dose ARC versus no treatment in the in the early 2000s from the British that showed a survival advantage, and we. Um, we get a similar and possibly better survival advantage with azacitidine versus low dose ARC. And it's not curative in, in almost any patient, uh, but is associated with improvement of cytopenias, improvement in, in survival, and probably, at least extrapolating from the MDS literature, an improvement in quality of life on average. So I, I think as a general rule, if that person wants to be treated and, and that fits with what they're accomplishing in life, that they ought to be treated and you're going you're gonna to help them. Um, the mm-hmm. standard has been to give azacitidine or decitabine in the United States. And, you know, the complete remissions rates are in the range of 20%, give or take. But, but the FDA approved venetoclax almost a year and a half ago based on a large phase two study that showed a remarkable improvement in the complete remission rate. And that complete remission rate goes up to close to 70%. And that seems to be regardless of your mutation status. Even better if you had a FLT3 or if you had an IDH mutation, as a matter of fact, if you had venetoclax. The problem is venetoclax makes it harder. You get a lot more myelosuppression. You have to give a lot more supportive care. It's hard to do the dose adjustments. The remissions happen more quickly. Uh, They happen in one month as opposed to four months with azacitidine. But that's becoming a rapid standard. 
At the same time as that data was released, a small randomized phase two study looked at low-dose ARC, which none of us, or few of us, use regularly in North America, or at least in the United States, with an oral hedgehog inhibitor called glasdikib. And it also showed an overall survival advantage. Mm -hmm. Now, the complete remission rates weren't so impressive in that study, but it showed a survival advantage. So we have these very impressive response rates with venetoclax that we think are improving outcomes. The phase two data showed a median survival that was almost 16 months, much better than the eight to 10 months we used to see. Glasdegib also, in a separate schedule, shows an improvement in overall survival. So it looks like combination therapy is the new standard, and most of us uh, at the moment give a, a venetoclax-based combination. It's certainly not wrong to give Glasdegib, and frankly, the data might even be stronger for it. One of the compelling abstracts at ASH, uh, I think it was really instructive, and it's sort of predicting how I think the future is going to go in this population, in your patient. It was a, a study of, of uh, azacitidine, uh, with or without, uh, pardon me, um, the uh, IDH2 inhibitor, mm-hmm. anacidinib, mm-hmm. in people who had an IDH2 mutation. And it recapitulated that finding of very high complete remission rates, much higher, but it did not translate into a survival advantage. And and so it kind of left us all scratching our heads a little bit, saying, well, hang on a second, we've all adopted venetoclax, because of the complete remission rate being so much higher. Now with this other drug for the IDH2 subset, giving anacidinib instead, you see the same thing, high CR rates, but you don't see the survival advantage. And, and we think it's because patients are now getting crossed over to other therapies. If they, if they, on that randomized study, if they didn't get anacidinib in the combination, many of them crossed over to it or went on to get some second or third line treatment. And that's a different landscape for us in older patients with AML, where we're not just giving one line of treatment and then saying, I'm sorry, we're done. Mm -hmm. We're now looking to see, is there a backup treatment? Can we change to an alternate agent? Can we give gemtuzumab? Is there another target? And so that's going to make it cloudier for us to see easy, straightforward survival advantages as patients have more options. It's not, you know, it's not as many options as we'd like, but it's more than we had. And that means that it's going to take a little bit of reading between the lines to really know where the benefit is. And we might even end up going to an event-free survival-based kind of outcome in the future in that population. Yeah, you know, in breast anyway, to get back to your patient, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to say in breast uh, cancer, I, this is exactly I, what we see because we have four or five, six lines. And so it's hard to show one line as overall survival advantage because you have multiple uh, backup lines of therapy. And um, so in this patient, as you're about to say, um, let me just decode a bit for me, the general practitioner. We're going to pause again and get our FLT3 mutation, our IDH1-2 mutation before deciding therapy. And could you mention, you know, how, where do you, so you're doing a bone marrow, and of course you can flow the blood in in the high burden circulating uh, cells patient. Where do you, what lab is taking that? And, And you said a bit about how long it takes. So where are you sending it? if maybe you're not at a university? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, these patients, the patient you described who had low counts ends up having a bone marrow biopsy. That workup can take one or two weeks. Yeah, you're, yeah. You know, maybe it's a patient you suspected MDS and you're, you're transfusing them and giving them supportive care or they're an outpatient and they're coming back two weeks later and the bone marrow biopsy comes back a little surprisingly showing AML. And um, a lot of the reference labs are now doing next-gen sequencing to look for mutations, and uh, that's now being packaged with normal pathology vendors. So I think that's just kind of happening for practitioners, Mm -hmm. even outside of university hospitals or academic centers. We're we're blessed at Mayo Clinic where we have all of our own infrastructure, and, 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 and it's outstanding. But in the community, that's takes a little longer, but it's coming back, and I think you should expect that within two weeks now. There was a really important study at ASH called the BEAT AML study, and it was uh, sponsored by the Leukemia Lymphoma uh, uh, Society, LLS, and it looked at getting the feasibility of getting rapid sequencing in seven days and assigning a treatment within seven days based on the mutations, and Mm -hmm. it's feasible. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should all be raising our expectations to try to get those results, certainly within two weeks. The problem is it means extra phone calls and it means following up on things and it doesn't yet fit into the easy flow of practice and that's where we have to learn how to how to adapt it. And I, I was going to extend that uh, comment into just managing those patients because those patients are now outpatients. They're yeah. getting a slightly more complicated regimen. Mm-hmm. They have more cytopenias. Their first month can be a little bumpier because you're, you're, they really do bottom out their blood counts. 
the remissions happen sooner, but it means also more phone calls and more CBCs and transfusion support. And so it's starting to change how we're looking at the outpatient practice, certainly at Mayo Clinic, and I bet you and Very colleagues true. and, and in the community it's happening too. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we're having to sort of find time to follow up on these things even when the patient's not right under our nose. And, and I, I, it's going to require different outpatient infrastructure to support these patients, and that's something where we all have to – be prepared uh, for, for how that's going to evolve. Couldn't agree more. It takes a lot of a lot of time and, and effort because the patients don't always use the phone or call you, yeah. and they think, well, the fever is normal, but then they don't call. Um, and I want to add in here that I have a patient now almost a year out, the MDS to AML, on the Vidaz and Venetoclax combination, and he's feeling great. Really? He's uh, 79, and right. he's swimming, and uh, so when it works, it really works well. So to recap that's this... Yeah, so this older patient who we posed, we're going to pause once again. Maybe she's in the outpatient setting already anyway because she's been seen for her MDS, so she now has AML and this is in the bone marrow. We're going to get our FIT3 mutation, IDH1-2, and that may guide special drugs in that direction. You've talked about the, the hypomethylating agents with venetoclax, and then another possibility is Glez, Glez to give, if I pronounce it right. Um, and then maybe yeah. maybe even maintenance in this group, um, of course, my patient's doing HMA, well, Venetoclax, uh, on and off. Yeah, you have to continue therapy. That's the problem so far. We haven't learned when you can stop it. And so there are treatment delays. There are dose reductions, um, especially with cumulative myelosuppression suppression of that combination. And we need better guidelines for how and when to reduce the dose of venetoclax to increase the frequency between cycles to sometimes reduce to five days of azacitidine. It's done by feel at the moment. And and it's better you know it's better if we fly by instruments than by by sight on this one mm-hmm. and and we need those instruments so I think we're all still waiting for for better guidelines from the randomized studies as to how the dose reduction should happen because you're right not you have to continue it or you lose the benefit and yet not all patients can stay right on schedule well you know that uh, reminds me to say as we draw this podcast to a close clinical trials what would you say your is your exciting or hoping to do a crew trial now in the Mayo or across the board in the leukemia groups across the country? Uh, two, it's immunotherapy. Um, mm, we yeah. are starting, uh, we're, we're joining an active CAR T trial in AML, and we're, joining, uh, and we're starting another innovative looking at new targets, not CD19, but new myeloid targets. And the second is the bispecific T enhancing uh, antibody constructs, where we're seeing complete remissions with some of the CD123 base bites. There are now CD33 bites and others in development, and and we're trying to learn how to capitalize on that, especially in patients who have a partial response or low disease setting. So we're we're very enthusiastic. About that. Well, you know the bite cells. I'll, I'll just put in this plug I'd set in the plenary uh, at Ash and saw Steve Schuster at the end right. on CAR T failures present a, a bite construct antibody that had a, an amazing response rate and remission rate for those, um, even some CRs um, who got this after CAR-T failure, which was phenomenal. So that's exciting stuff. Well, James, I, I want to thank you very much for taking this topic, which has always scared me to death uh, as a fellow and as a practitioner to did AML, and I, I, I admire that you're the chair to remind our audience that we're speaking to Dr. James Foran, who is associate professor at the Mayo Clinic and chair of the leukemia group there. And um, our listeners can hear bullet points, show notes, from what we've discussed today on our website. Four of our budding HEMOC residents going into fellowship here at Pennsylvania Hospital will dutifully decode this and put it on our website, mdedge.com slash hematology-oncology. And so, James, thanks again so much, and thank you all for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. And that concludes the interview portion of our show this week. Don't forget there are robust show notes available courtesy of Dr. Dabika Biswal, wherever notes are found in your app. Coming up after the break, clinical correlation. Welcome back to Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I am Nick Andrews. It's time now for clinical correlation with Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. I'm Dr. Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. Memories, to say the least, are fickle. We often remember snippets of situations, and two people in the same situation can walk away remembering very different aspects of it. This couldn't be clearer to me than recently, 
when I reunited with a patient I had cared for several years ago as a resident. I'll change several details of this story to protect privacy. At the time, I had met her in the inpatient setting. She was hospitalized for leukemia, and we were giving her induction chemotherapy. I had several pressing memories from that time. I remembered getting many pages from the nurses about her as I ordered different medications for things like nausea and insomnia. I remember that despite all this, her odds of cure were quite good, and so I tried to encourage her to keep going every day, even as the chemotherapy was hard for her. I hadn't seen her since, and this year I ran into her in the oncology clinic I happened to be rotating through. I was about to introduce myself, but as soon as I saw and recognized her, I said, Oh, do you remember me? She said she did, but just in case, I told her my name again and the last time we had met. Yes, she said, she remembered. As we got to talking more, I saw that she didn't really remember much of that hospitalization at all. She was doing really well now, and as she said, she tried to block the bad memories out. She didn't seem to remember too many details about her prognosis, about the chemotherapy she received, or about the infectious complications. She only had one memory of me from that time, she said, near the end of the visit. "Uh Uh-oh, what was it? I asked hesitantly. I was really upset about something, she said. I don't remember what. But you asked if you could hug me, and then you hugged me. Oh, I said. No, she said. I really liked it. The thing is, I honestly don't remember that at all. The poet Maya Angelou once said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. To me, the most relevant part of her illness was the treatment and her medical trajectory. To her, years later, maybe it was a hug. I'm not saying this was the most important part of her care, of course, but there was something so simple and generous about the part she remembered. Here's to remembering that the small gestures can matter. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll tune in next time for Clinical Correlation. Big thank you to Dr. Yurkowitz, as always, for the human side of hematology and oncology care. That concludes episode 59 of Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. It's time now for this week's credits. Blood and Cancer is produced and hosted by the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. Blood and Cancer is produced by executive editor and the editor of MDH Hematology Oncology, Mary Ellen Schneider. All MDH podcasts are produced by our editor-in-chief, Dr. Ivan Oransky, and executive editor, Kathy Scarbeck, along with multimedia editor, Terry Rudd. Social media is produced by Kyla Clark. Our guest this week was Dr. James Foran. I'm your audio engineer, audio editor, and the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. <laughs>